I don't envy that situation, having to deal with a lot of old people who have already made up their minds about the way that the world is and where money should go. Um, I deal with college students, as Jaime has talked about. Um, I work at the University of St. Thomas. My name is Chevis Amin. I'm a biology professor there. The original inspiration for this talk was to talk about some of the, the restoration efforts that we've done on our campus. Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to sit a lot of out of place when I tell you about what we've done because essentially we're going to restore something that is the size of somebody's backyard, right? It's not, a, it's not parks. It's not, it's not green spaces. We're not changing cities. We're doing a very, very small element of the city. But most of what I do is to try to impact college-age students. I see a lot of value in that, and clearly I've kind of motivated my life to, to, to working with this population. And so the current age of students that are coming through to me in college are now known as genera Generation Z. We're done with millennials, now we're into Generation Z. Um, it's just going to keep going on forever until we run out of letters, which I think we're there, so it's going to be an issue. Um, so Generation Z are people that were born in about the year 2000, right? So 2018, they're 18 years old, they're going to college. Um, and Wikipedia says that most of them have had the internet since a young age. They're comfortable with technology, they love social media, and they also seem to love urban conservation. I added that last part in there, right? So that, <laughs> that, that, that totally is me. Uh, but it, I think it's true, actually. Like, so this is not going to be a doom and gloomy talk, even though there, there, there are elements of doom and gloomy that we could put into it. But I think that like this group of young people that are coming through, they actually seem to care a little bit more than you might think they do, right? And so one of the things that we're always worried is that their faces are always buried in their cell phones. I, I submit that this may not be the worst thing. Let me show you something first before we go through. I had many slides talking about generations and all that. I had to cut that because I have a tendency to talk way too much. Um, but I did want to show this video. So baby boomers are people that were born about 1940, right? So this is what the world out in Katy which is not what we consider to be urban, I guess, in 1940 looked like. So if you're a baby boomer, this is what you grew up. I mean, we've seen a bunch of pictures already that you could look out and identify some wonderful features that are there that represent prairie, right? You have these natural watering holes, all of these kinds of things. So this is a video, um, and I, see, I hope it'll play. Okay, good. So this is a time lapse. This is 1978. It's 1989, it's 1995, watch here in the corner, next one, that's the mall. And then, so th if you were Generation Z, this is what your world looks like now, right? Compared to the couple of generations I showed you before, this is what you grew up, this is what your life looks like, right? So in a minute, I'm going to tell you about restoring something that is like the size of a backyard. You might think, what is the point of this? You're not going to really change the ecological world just by changing one area. But I think it's bigger than that. Because what, what you will find is that this is all that young people know today. But that doesn't mean that they're hopeless in this world. And, and I told you that cell phones are kind of a key thing here. This is the biggest worry that we have. Their faces are buried in the cell phone. They live in the concrete jungle. They'll never know anything about what they're supposed to see in the world. But cell phones have an advantage. They share information. And they share issues very quickly. So a, a hallmark of the Generation Z is social media, right? Like Instagram, Facebook, the things that you'll never trouble me to ever do because I don't care because I was on the very edge of the millennial generation, which apparently that's not a thing that we do. But these young kids, they care about it a lot. And so one of the things that they know about is that the world, the climate, what we've been doing to it as human beings, what we've been doing to the earth, we've been destroying it. They know it. They completely know that we are destroying the world. They are really interested in things like social justice, right? So college kids generally in the United States of America have always been a place where social justice kind of starts, right? If you think in the 1970s, there's a lot of social movements that happen there. If you check social media, certainly there are big social problems today, but even bigger on social media is what we are doing to the environment, climate change, loss of, loss of ice, right? Loss of habitat. They know it. They're not blind to it. So they want to do something about it, right? And so one of the things that we're seeing on college campuses, and there are a lot of reasons why this is happening, but one of the things is that students, young people, want to make differences with their own hands. They see the problems. They have, they're bored of cell phones now, 
They'll go out and they'll do something if you give them some, some actual task to do. And so there's a lot of really good conservation projects going on college campuses. I don't have enough time to tell you about all of them, so I'm going to tell you about two of them. I'm going to tell you about the one that went on in my campus, the University of St. Thomas. And I'll tell you a little bit about the work that my wife, Cassidy Johnson, who, if anybody knows her, she's a really special person. She's done some really incredible things as well. And I'll tell you about them. But I'll give you a little bit of overview before I go into the nitty-gritty details of our particular um, sites. So in about 2016, the Katy Perry Conservancy hosted this crowdfunding campaign called Grassroots for Change, which I think the purpose of it was to get college campuses involved in the process of restoration, really on their own campus. And many campuses have done stuff since then. U of H Central Campus, U of H D, University of St. Thomas, and even Rice have all started to kind of put prairies onto their campus. Um, and a lot of them have been student-led efforts. So I think that's the real key here is that when things like this are super successful, it's because you have really a small number of students that are passionate about it. And because they're linked with so many other students through social media, they can recruit a lot very quickly. They don't all have to be passionate. They just have to know that there's something that they should care about. And the central student will make a big difference. So, I'll, so this student that's up here that I'll talk about in the left hand, that's Erin Novak. Um, Erin Novak actually worked for Kelly. Um, she is a special, special kid. You only get so many Aaron Novaks in the world. But because of the way that the world works now with the social media works, one Aaron Novak can recruit tons of students. So eventually Aaron will, will tell you, or I'll show you about the stuff that Aaron did, and we'll have like 40, 50 volunteers. I've never had problems getting volunteers on my campus to work on this prairie site. So this is where our prairie site is going to be. <clears throat> this is no, it's going to be eventually known as the Father Myers Prairie. Uh, Aaron really got into this work because I brainwashed her during my ecology class. <clears throat> This is absolute truth. I spend an entire semester trying to teach students about the human impacts on the ecological world, and I try to open their eyes to what's going on. And many of them, at the end of it, will become very passionate about it. Right? I've had three students now that I, that I get every, like in a cycle, that I will essentially change their career path because they wanted to go be a doctor. They wanted to be a nurse. And then they realized that there's really important things going on, and they decide they want to do conservation. So this is the site that was, she, she, she petitioned. She did reports. I could, I could talk two hours about all the things Erin did, but I'd rather just kind of show you what the fruits of her labors were. So that's the site that we're going to restore. We came in, and um, they put herbicide treatment on it, right? So that killed off a lot of the, um, the, the grass that's up on the top there. And then we came in, uh, cut out that sod. And so we had it ready there for our planting day. Okay, so using social media, we blasted a whole, many groups of students, many student organizations. Uh, we even got one of our priests to come out, University of St. Thomas is a Catholic or, uh, institution. So Father Ted comes out and he blesses the ground. Um, I wanted him to talk for a couple minutes. He talked for about 20, whatever. That's just how it goes. Um, we then, we had a large amount of topsoil that we had to move around in, in the area. That's about eight yards of topsoil. We also had three tons of, um, of rocks to create paths. Um, we got tons of students to come in there. They spread it around. They did a great job. They moved that eight yards of soil in less than two hours. I mean, they came in. They were ready to work. Many of them don't really know much about prairies, but they just want to work. Like, they're just like a young dog that you might have that you just have to run around in the backyard. You're like, here's a shovel. Just go move dirt, right? And you have to kind of sometimes know your population. But they work their butts off, and they do a really good job when they get out there. <clears throat> so we got all the dirt spread around. I'm going to do this part now where Jaime's not here because this is the perfect time to do it. So then once we had the dirt spread around, we had to get the plants out. And so Jaime came in and started to give one of his lectures. So this was like Father Ted. I thought this was going to be a couple-minute thing. And it, <laughs> it obviously carried on um, enough that I could actually get him. He brought his little banner out, right? And he was educating the students. And I would make fun of him for this. He's not here right here in the room. So this is really mean that I'm making fun of him for it. But actually, this had a, a supreme amount of value, OK? The students are there, they're receptive to the moment, they're thinking about what they're doing, they have their hands in the dirt, and then you show them the length of the roots that these things will eventually go down. And it really does, it changes their perception on what they're doing, it becomes a very powerful moment, right? So then after we did that, they went out and they started to put the plants out. Um, and and they, they took the time, they kind of arranged them out. We didn't have a master plan for this. We just had a lot of plants. Some of them were purchased, some of them were donated. Some, people, some of them came out of volunteers' backyards. They're like, I have all the grass, let's just put it out here, right? And so we had a lot of different grass. We had a lot of different seed from the Native American Seed Company that we put out there as well. Um, and at the end of it, we took something that looked like this, 
and we kind of made it look like that. That looks terrible. <laughs> like, I'll be perfectly honest, like that does not look like a prairie. It looks terrible. I had to talk to my facilities guy like week after week. He's like, is this what it's going to look like? I'm like, no, Howard, it's going to look better. Trust me, it's going to look better. So then we get to August, right? And um, you can see it. That's all sunflower. Howard comes back to me. Is this what it's going to look like? Like, this is what an empty lot looks like. This doesn't look good. The, the nice thing is they kind of trust me there. They shouldn't really, but they do trust me. Um, and I told them, I said, it's going to get better. But, you know, at, at four months in, it's basically a bunch of sunflower. Um, a lot of things are dying out from underneath it. But this is, as many of you know, this is kind of the process of restoration. The first time you take a pass at it, it doesn't really look good. It looks a lot like sunflowers. Um, we came in here. Again, I never have any trouble getting volunteers. December, we went out there. We cleared out some of those sunflowers. Um, I even have a picture. President's Day of Service was early in the next, um, next year. Had a ton of uh, volunteers come out. We, we scraped that whole thing down to about this point right here. Just cut it down flat. Got rid of all the ugliness and said, let's just start it in the, with the beginning of the, the spring. Let's see what comes up from it. And man, oh, man, did it come up. And it was beautiful. Okay, so, so ugly duckling year one. You just give it like a half a year, and it, it just came through for us, and it was gorgeous. So early April, the blue bonnets came out. I know that there are probably some hardcore prairie ecologists right now that are going to say, that's not the right species. That's okay. Okay? Like, kids like to see blue bonnets. Facts, right? So sometimes you just got to put them out there to get people interested. And they come out real early, so it's real nice to have them come out. We, we had the blue bonnets come out. Um, so that's kind of like a, a landscape shot of the whole thing. We come out a, a little later in April, the wine cups are starting to come up, the rosin weed comes up. You start to see the colors start to change really uh, rapidly. Um, it starts to get really, really pretty in there. I mean, all kinds of flowers and grasses coming up in the area. Um, we get to mid-May, again, it changes color, right? So, you know, I heard y'all talking about how like, people love trees because trees change colors. These things change colors in the most beautiful, way more than a tree could change colors. The, the amount of color change that you can get in a really nice area like this is incredible. Um, and, and, and it's still changing colors, to be honest. I went there yesterday, right? And you'll see that even yesterday there was a different set of colors that you got before. That's my rattlesnake master in there that I've been babying in there. I love that plant. It's so awesome. Uh, but you can see that the, even the colors, they change as you go through it. It was a really, really neat project, um, and, it, and it worked out really really well. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what co how much time I have here. I I, I'm a green card. Okay, good. So this, this, this is the University of St. Thomas. I'll say that I, I think this is going really, really well. Um, I can't wait to see what happens next semester. We've got it. We're, we're developing our management plans. We're still learning how to deal with it. Students are really passionate about working with it. They come out to it often. They ask, how, what can I do next? Uh, what, like, when it's going well, they're like, what can we do to it? I'm like, you just sit here and enjoy it for right now. Like, we'll do a lot of work later, but right now is like the fruits of your labor. Um, but they're starting to grow plants now, right? They have growing tables. I have a whole set of plants that I need to get somewhere to, to plant at some point. So that's something that I need to do it, is find somebody who wants plants. Um, but I've got a bunch of students that are now interested in doing that kind of stuff. I'm going to switch gears slightly to talk about a different institution. I'm going to talk about my wife, Cassie Johnson. Um, those of you that know her know that she's a really special person. Person. Um, a lot of my love for nature is actually transmitted from her. And she had kind of the same kind of task that I did was to get a, a prairie on a campus. Um, her challenge was to do it at, at Rice University. Um, at UST, I did everything organically. I didn't have to run everything through a class. I could just go to students and I'd say, you should start a prairie. I started their interest in a class. But it wasn't really like the class was not designed to make the prairie. Cassidy took it a little bit differently. She made a series of classes that would physically design a prairie and, and propose it to the institution. So in the first class, she had them actually like identify a space. So there's this Harris Gully natural area. It's just a retention basin for, the, for Rice University. I, when I was there, it was just nothing but like sunflowers, like I showed you in the first few pictures of my prairie, right? Um, nothing special about it, but a lot of potential on campus. So the first class that she had, the students made ideas of what they could do with it, eventually choosing a, a prairie restoration. Second course, they wrote a proposal about how to put this prairie in. Third course, 
they actually like put the prairie in. So like course by course by course, she guided the students and she got them to actually build the prairie on campus. Um, they even covered this in the Rice News, right? So these are pictures that I just took off of Rice's website where they wrote articles about Cassidy's work getting them to install the prairie. And they just recently, just this past, um, I think it was May, I want to say, um, had a prairie uh, a planting event. This is the first planting event in the Harris Gully natural area. So they just got it out there. It, as most restoration projects, you just get it out there. It looks sad, right? It's just like a sparse set of plants and you're like hoping it's going to fill in. And it certainly will, right, once that seed bank kind of kicks and things will change for it. But this is the first start. They got an acre planted. They are going to put in a second acre um, within a year. And so they're, they're starting to really expand and go after it. And the students love it there too. So I think what I kind of wanted to end here with is just kind of the lessons that we can learn through these projects. Like I said, I'm, I'm probably not going to change the, the world ecologically in this one small area that I'm restoring. But we learn a lot about the kids that we work with. So College kids are very passionate about change, about making positive change, and they're very sensitive to environmental issues. And one of the things that's really interesting, they're passionate beyond what you would identify as like political boundaries, social boundaries, racial boundaries, ethnic boundaries. They haven't developed these biases yet. Okay, They're old enough to contemplate the world, not old enough to be jaded by it. So they have learned a lot. And I, at University of St. Thomas, you can consider a very cons conservative institution. Rice, you consider a very liberal institution. But you saw no difference in the passion of the students that work on these things, because that's pretty much how it goes these days. College students are really passionate about working these things. Hands-on engagement, I think, is the best way to get the young generation involved. You've got to get them working with their hands. If you need volunteers, let me know. Right? Uh, we can try to get students out there. It, the hard part is scheduling so college students can actually get out there because they essentially have college classes when you would want to do most of your restoration. And social media is a very powerful thing. I have a list of people that have helped us in these projects, but there's, this slide could have been 19 for all I'm concerned. There were so many people that have made prairies on campus possible. KPC, Nature Conservancy, our University of St. Thomas Facilities Department was super helpful. Rice, our, our, Rice's Arboretum Committee, the grounds teams at both institutions really helping us and keeping it maintained. Um, the Audubon, um, really good helping us with plants. And even community volunteers, there's people in this room that actually came out to some of these different sites and really helped us a lot. And I really Really appreciate all your efforts as well. So I just kind of leave you with this. If you if you want to work with college students, just contact me or Cassidy. Like that's pretty much the start of it. We'll we'll find you student organizations. We'll find you people. Even if you don't want to work with our schools, we'll find you people at other schools because I think it's really important that you work with this population. They are ready to listen to you. They really care. I was listening to a conversation earlier about how the interns that people had had recently were really really good. I don't think that's a fluke, right? I think that you're in a, you're in a golden time with some of these people. They are, they are very worldly, and they want to be able to contribute. So I'll just kind of stop there and...